20 seconds on the of the news. Uh, welcome to the Genetic Engineering and Society Colloquium. My name is Jason Delbord, and I'm uh, one of the faculty uh, in the Executive Committee in the Center. Uh, we're really happy to have you all here. Uh, we run this colloquium every week, and um, it's really fun. I think we, we almost always have a new face in the room, which is fun, um, and, and lots of people have returned. So really glad that, that you all have come today. Uh, we always start with just any announcements about upcoming events around genetic engineering and society activities. So anything that anyone wants to announce coming up? Oh, I do. If anyone has anything UN CBD related that you would like submitted into that process, um, you need to send it to me by the 15th. Okay. Or actually by the 13th, because it needs to be uh, by the What 15th. is UN CBD? The Convention on Biological Diversity. So I sent out a long email a couple of weeks ago about it. I'll resend it probably today, but just wanted to remind everyone. If you and these are resources that would be submitted into the project. Yes. Right? Yeah. Good. Yeah, thanks for leading that. And I just want to remind everybody that Jason sent out a position in Hawaii for a coordinator of technologies, and it's kind of based on what I do with G-Bird. This person was in my chain of command. So if you know anybody who would be interested in that position and what it entails, uh, please extend that position to them, and if they want to talk to me, I'm open to it. Thank you. Great. Um, and I've had some communication with those folks as well, um, so I can talk to you about their interests and the kind of groundwork they've laid in terms of doing, thinking about community engagement and things like that. That's for island conservation? No, it's ABC, ABC the American Bird Conservancy. Yeah. Yeah. So back here. Well, back here related. And it's a limited term, right? Yeah, I one think so. I think it's one, one or two years. Yeah. Yeah. They have funding for one or two years. Kind of like, kind of like mine. I had funding for one year. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Anything else? You can put the next up. All right, great. Um, well, today we are uh, very, very happy to have Natalie Poplar uh, as our guest speaker. Um, and her, she's going to start her talk with a little bit about her own story of how she got where she is, which is really a nice thing we ask our speakers to do. So I'm not going to give you a full biography, but I want to I want to whet your appetite <laughs> for the, the diversity that, that Natalie brings to the room. Um, so as an undergraduate at McGill, um, she majored in anatomy and cell biology, but got a minor in international development studies. Okay. She has a master's in nutrition from Columbia, also a PhD in cellular and molecular biology from Columbia, um, and she did a, a postdoc at Yale in cardiology. I like Larry. And then, <laughs> to just add another wrinkle, um, the thing that, that really brought us uh, brought us into communication and, and made us want to invite Natalie to come speak to us is that she's been leading this new effort to think about uh, what she's called editing nature. Um, and that uh, included a, a major workshop uh, Jennifer Kuzma attended. Anybody else from NC State? No, and unfortunately Jennifer I, came I, in spirit, but not I came in spirit. You came in spirit. Yeah, yeah. I got like an airport. Oh, or a snow, it was a snowstorm. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> The, uh, but we work process. together since. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, that workshop then led to uh, the publication in Science called Editing Nature, Local Roots of Global Governance. Um, and this lays out some thinking about ways to combine local community engagement um, and sort of global governance processes in terms of thinking about how we might design and develop uh, environmental genetic technologies. Um, so she's really at the forefront of thinking about the ways that we are starting to think about intervening into environmental issues with genetic technologies. And that's something that a lot of us in this room work on in different ways, um, and Natalie is, is really a leader in promoting the conversation um, around these issues. So we're really happy to have you here, um, and please take it away. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a lovely introduction. And um, again, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to visit and speak today, and it's just been so wonderful to finally meet some of my colleagues that, you know, we've had so many phone calls of, but never actually met in person. So it's been wonderful to meet them in person and then meet a lot of new faces as well. Um, so what I was hoping to do is start this, I'm going to keep this as relatively brief because I do really want to have lots of time for discussion and conversation. That's sort of my jam as well. And I, I want to, some, these are some really big sort of big issues to think about, so I really am hoping to learn from you all and think about how we can move forward. Um, but I wanted to sort of structure my talk with first giving you um, a more sort of extensive idea of my story and, and where I come from, and I think 
that's important because a lot of the work that I'm doing now is sort of this external reflection of my own sort of histories and what I and my emotions and intellect, and so I wanted to kind of give that background. Um, and then go into sort of what we have done recently with these, uh, this proposal around global governance of environmental genetic technologies, and then finish um, with some things that I'm thinking about recently around um, the environmental ethics that we employ to think about these sorts of technologies and decisions around them and how important I think it will be to maybe start to evolve those ethics to um, be able to address these questions of editing the environment. So, here was here is where I was maybe four years ago. Um, I, as a child and growing up, I spent a lot of time here. This is a, a lake called Blackstone Lake, around about three hours north of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. Um, it's probably the place in the world that I feel most myself, that I feel most connected to nature. Um, that's probably the most sort of where I get reconnected and I sort of get refurbished. And it was it's a place that's really important to me. And, um, and all through my life, non-human nature has always been really important to me. I felt deep connection um, with nature when I'd be in the woods. Um, I thought about um, it as almost this extension of my family. And at the same time, though, I, I love biology, and I think that's why I did science, because I love learning about the natural world. Um, and eventually I got to a place here, this is my lab um, that I was in doing my doctorate work at Columbia, um, studying how certain, a specific receptor called a notch receptor regulates blood vessel development in the retina of eyes, of mice. Um, and it basically became sort of the most unnatural environment that I felt like I could be in. Um, I'd have to go back here for weeks every summer to kind of like recharge. Um, and I felt like my work was sort of becoming more and more narrow, um, more sort of dissociated from what was happening on the larger scale of society. Um, and I was having to check, check huge parts of myself at the door. Um, it just wasn't going to work anymore. Um, and two sort of things happened in my life that helped me sort of take this new course that I'm now on. Uh, one is that I read this book. Uh, by Robin Kimmer called Braiding Sweetgrass, and it's probably one of the most influential books I've ever read in my life. Uh, Robin tells this beautiful story of her own personal experience um, about sort of trying to integrate her um, sort of indigenous um, thinkings around nature and integrate that with her scientific you know, structures around studying botany. Um, and so she obviously has her own histories that are very different than mine, but I was still struggling with these ideas of how to integrate the science and the non-science. Um, and a lot of what she did helped me kind of move forward. The second was this beautiful beetle. <laughs> um, I, while in the, doing my cardiology work at, at Yale, so the nice thing about Yale is Yale's really small, so the medical school is literally like five minutes from like the school of forestry. So I go up and hang out at the school of forestry trying to sort out my next stages of my life because I was so unhappy in the lab. Um, and I started going to ecology and conservation talks just to kind of broaden my horizons. Um, and it was at a talk on invasive species, we you know when people were talking about how do we deal with exotic species and how can we get rid of them. Um, and the beautiful emerald ash borer came up as, as a case study. You know, they're basically destroying ash trees throughout, uh, you know, the U.S. and Canada sort of forest, hardwood forest. And um, at that point, really, the idea is where you either have to, you know, use insecticides, you have to physically remove invasive species, or you basically introduce another exotic species that would serve as a predator for that invasive species. And it was there where I was like, oh, there's got to be some biotech going on to, to think about that. And that's when I started diving into thinking about what are sort of these genetic technologies to look at conservation. This also aligned with its time when this particular protein became very popular. This is Cas9, which is involved in CRISPR gene editing. And it allows you to make basically any genetic change to any sort of genome in a really targeted specific, easy to, to use way. And so we have been using this in the lab, in the cardiology lab, um, as a research tool. Um, and then I started realizing that people were thinking about using this for the environment. Um, either on its own to genetically engineer wild species to provide perhaps more resilience to threats like climate change, 
um, or to couple it with what's called a gene drive to allow you not only to make any genetic change that you would like, but also force that genetic change through a wild population. And that's a game changer, because if you think about it, right, and most of us in this room know that if you were to release just sort of one genetically engineered species, natural selection would, or organism, natural selection would really quickly sort of eliminate it from a wild population. But a gene drive, of course, allows you to instead sort of override those pressures and push it through through a population to really transform a population. And so my immediate response was really like, whoa, that's pretty exciting. That could create this whole new opportunity to deal with some of these really huge issues um, that we're facing. And at the same time, it was like, holy, crap, um, that's also really frightening. And if that's not done responsibly, then we could be in a really big mess. And so that was my motivation that got me in front of some of the right people at Yale to put on this summit that we hosted, that Night Nature Summit in 2017, to really think about these issues on a really deep level. And the issues we were thinking about were sort of, again, how could these technologies be used to either sort of restore ecosystems? So here's the American chestnut that's basically gone functionally extinct in the US. How could these technologies be used to bring back this once um, dominant tree in, in hardwood forests in the Northeast? Um, ways to suppress populations, so whether these are vectors of disease, um, you know, like mosquitoes that carry malaria or, or Lyme disease. Um, or even agricultural pests, that's the diamondback moth up there at the top. Um, or to transform species, so actually thinking about using genetic engineering to alter coral reefs, for example, so that they could withstand rising sea temperatures. Um, and, and as you can imagine, this is, these are big questions. These are looking at um, sort of an entirely new way that humans would sort of be inter fearing or engineering natural processes. And so this, I thought, required really, really deep reflection. And it was a reflection that was based on ideas of integration. So ideas about thinking about how can we integrate um, as many sort of diverse expertise as we can in the room that need to be there. So whether those are geneticists, ecologists, philosophers, uh, regulatory experts, how can we integrate um, our heads and our hearts. That was also a really big thing for me, that these, these are intellectual issues, but they're also really value-based emotional issues, and we need this big space that allows us to come in with our totality. Um, and so that was sort of what was the premise for, for the summit that we hosted. Um, and here sort of, it, it was this combination of public talks that a lot of people came to, and then we also had these, these small uh, working group of, of people, again, coming from all over the US, very different expertise, different worldviews, um, to really think about this idea of, of what does it mean uh, to edit nature. And, and some of the major sort of themes that came out of, 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 of the talk and sort of what was sort of our, our grounding was sort of, firstly, why does this feel so different? What is so different about this idea about genetically engineering? Uh, wild species as compared to the many other ways that humans had intervened in the natural world for you know, eons. Um, and, and it came down to kind of these three different things. Uh, one was the complexity. So this is highly complex stuff, whether it's at the genetic level, so literally what happens if we do make these tweaks to genomes and these other sort of underlying issues that could occur or different networks that could be altered in ways that we're not aware of. Um, it's super complex at the ecological level. Here we are altering a species, maybe bringing back a species or removing one. What changes to ecological food networks and the other species that might depend on that species that you're changing? And then it's also complex in the human value sense, right? People have really different feelings about doing this and really strong feelings. And those have to be sort of recognized and, and reflected upon. I think the other second thing that's like, that really is unique to thinking about gene genetically engineering wild species is also um, something to do with time and speed. And again, that's in two ways. So one, the, de the tech technology type. technology is developing um, actually really quite quickly. And so there's fears there, again, that our ethical frameworks and regulatory frameworks might not be able to keep pace. Um, but it's also changing the temporal sort of scope of evolution, right? Things are now going to be evolving in ways that we're kind of forcing that might not be in the normal temporal scale that things were sort of changed by. And so I think that was something also that we felt was very unique here. And then of course, the third is just the, that this potential to transform in ways that might be irreversible and the broad impacts that that could have, right? So this isn't about containing GMO crops to a particular sort of, um, you know, space for agriculture. This is about the intention of literally releasing wild species into the wild that 
will reproduce and spread and likely cross, cross international borders. And so the, the scale of impact to us felt much larger than previous conversations that we've had. Um, and what we recognize is that at this point in time, there was a major void in, in global governance of these sorts of technologies. We knew about projects either at various levels of, of sort of completion that were happening all around the world. You know, so there's been discussions in, in Hawaii about talking about using genetic engineering to alter um, populations of, of an invasive mosquito population that's you know really impacting wild bird populations. Chestnut trees are thinking of, are close to being you know planted and, and well, are being field, in field trials and, and deregulated for for, for reproduction and spread in the wild. You know, there's discussions around using about using mosquito um, suppression to, to fight infectious diseases in different countries in Africa, and and then also even in, in the um, Australia and New Zealand regions talking about using these to eliminate invasive species, um, coral restoration, and so again, there's this issue where it's happening all over the world. These species are likely to cross international borders, and there's really no sort of framework right now to sort of regulate how how that should be, how those decisions should be made. Um, and just to give background, I mean, there are attempts, I'm sure many of you in this room are, are aware of these, um, to try and start to create some sort of policy around this, right? So um, one of the great first starts was the National Academy's report on gene drives, which was really a really thorough, thoughtful review of how these technologies should move forward. And, and really one of the major recommendations from a global governance standpoint that they made was that it should fall under the Convention on Biological Diversity at the UN to sort of govern how these, how these um, Organisms should be should be regulated, um, but anyone that spent some time there, I know there's some people that have in this room. Um, that's a really uh, difficult, complicated situation. Um, and again, when we think about the temporal issues here of the time that might, how quickly these things are moving, um, and sometimes the slowness that we see of trying to find sort of negotiations at work, um, that was a concern for us that they could keep up. I should also note that the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, is also in the process of developing policy, but again, it's still going to determine when that will be ready and, and also how much, how kind of comprehensive it can be. Um, so what we have been seeing, and, and again, um, is sort of the, arri the arrival of some more soft governance proposals of these technologies. Um, you know, so Herbert Jasnovov had this paper that came out in Nature that was more around gene editing more generally, um, mainly focusing actually on humans, but with these ideas of having sort of this um, clearinghouse that would bring together really interdisciplinary sort of cosmetologists and thinkers about gene editing and really think about it from sort of a more society, you know, more focused on the societal implications of the technology, less so on the science. Um, Arij is, has also kind of cropped up as this, as the Association for Responsible Research and Innovation in Genome Editing. Um, it's sort of more of this like international sort of union idea um, where people are, you know, different groups and stakeholders are members. And again, both of these the ideas here were to have sort of these, um, you know, broad discussions that would bring sort of different people with different worldviews together to think about the technology and try and steer it responsibly. But what we felt was really missing from this, and it's sort of, um, if you think about the word observatory, right? This is this idea of kind of sitting up in high and sort of coming up with these big ideas and then trying to sort of enforce them on the ground. And we felt that this was going to be a major issue because decisions around this technology are first highly context dependent. It's going to be dependent on the organism being altered, the changes being made to that organism, the communities that would be impacted by that. Um, and we also felt that it was really critically important from an equity and justice standpoint that communities that are going to be impacted by these decisions have a right to the decision-making authority. And we felt that in both situations like this, there wasn't enough attention given to that sort of situation and those sorts of needs. And so, and I actually, this is the first time I've ever done this, partly by put my paper up on a slide, but I think it's partly because I'm really proud of it. And um, secondly, I think it's, I also do this because I want to show the list of authors. Um, because to me, this is something that's really exciting. We have um, people that represent over 12 different institutes and like nine different disciplines on our authorship list. You're gonna recognize some of the names here. Here's Jennifer there. Um, but you know, really, really um, great thinkers in this space. Jim Collins was the co-director, or led the, um, co-led the uh, Gene Drive Report for the National Academies. Um, we have Kevin Esbelt, one of the co-inventors of, of the gene drive, CRISPR-based gene drives technologies, and Michael Nelson, who's this 
a really thoughtful environmental philosopher um, at Oregon State amongst, and I'm just like naming out certain people, but it was just this really beautiful group of people, and this was, this was, this was our, our baby in a way. We, we birthed this all together, which is, I think, really exciting. And really, I think what is important about what we're proposing is we're sort of shifting, we're shifting the focus and sort of reorienting in a way that we feel that this actually needs to be the, the sort of ground driving force of decision making, that these need to be locally based in the communities where, where these sorts of technologies are being proposed. Um, and it needs to have, um, local communities have to have authority in the decision making process. And that what then happens is that decision making process gets supported from a global coordinating body that can provide sort of the resources that allow for this to occur and can also provide sort of the support and assurance that the decision making um, has authority in, in sort of regulatory space. Um, and so just to kind of break this down of how we envision both this toggling between local and global, because this is this was really difficult. It is a real, real challenge to figure out how to integrate the two and make sure both aspects can work in unison to make to make sort of responsible, informed decisions. Um, and so, how we saw this happening is that on the local deliberation side. So, say, let's take an example. Let's go together to. Um, Burkina Faso, where Target Malaria is now thinking about developing gene drive to eliminate um, mosquito vectors that carry malaria. Let's go to Burkina Faso and think about how, on a local state level, that, that would work in the deliberation process. Um, and what we saw is we, we saw this as having sort of a locally led steering committee and body that would sort of bring together the local representatives that would need to be part of that decision. We also see that not occurring in complete isolation because. A community in Burkina Faso also should not be able to decide the full decision making alone in an isolation when there's an organism that can spread across boundaries and have impacts on, actually could potentially have impacts on large scale. And so we saw that in integrating local deliberation with more interdisciplinary global expertise that could come in and bring the expertise that would be needed, like ecological, um, you know, sort of factors and things that would sort of need to be part of an informed decision. Um, we thought that was important, but there still needs to be, again, attention to thinking about who has been left out of these conversations in the past and giving really strong focus on ensuring that historically marginalized voices are included. For me, what was really important, and I think this was something that was a bit different um, than it would been, had been said in the past, and something I felt really um, important uh, or really strongly about is also expanding this to also give voice to things that don't technically or normally have voice in these decisions. Mm -hmm. So how can we think about giving voice to the non-human organisms? And I know that sounds really strange sometimes from like a Western um, idea and perspectives around the environment, um, but we do see stirrings of things like legal rights of nature, where we see in different, in New Zealand, for example, rivers are now being given personhood and legal right to sort of stand up for their legal um, respect that they deserve. And I thought this was really important that what happens to a conversation when you have a custodian talking for the mosquito at the table? Um, and really thinking and really sort of changing our perspective of how we look at these things. Or it's also talking for future generations. Um, because our children's children would also be impacted by these sorts of decisions. And then I think the last thing that was really important is trying to create a framework for local deliberation that has this focus on virtues. So what needs to happen to come to a table and really discuss about something openly and meaningfully? What sort of virtues need to be expressed by the people at those, or being sort of embodied by the people at the table? And to us, it was really critical that you have to come to these conversations with some sense of humility and understanding sort of the, the limits of what we do know and, and don't know and understanding and an understanding wanting to hear other worldviews. Um, that also ties into respect. Um, you obviously need to also have some, some ability to kind of sort of think systematically and interdisciplinarily because these are such multifaceted issues and so we need to be able to think beyond sort of our, our general what we know and sort of expand beyond that. And I, and I think this was the one that was really important to us too is that there has to be an underlying appreciation for care for the planet. And I think without that, we will not be able to make decisions that are responsible for the environment, but also even for our own um, human health. So that was sort of thinking about what deliberation looks on the, on the local scale, and then thinking about sort of how a global coordinating body would, would support that. 
One would be to help produce sort of these standardized integrated deliberative frameworks that do ensure representation of marginalized com communities, representation of the expertise that would be needed at the table. Um, there would also be sort of this idea of thinking about how a standardized deliberative report comes out of these sorts of deliberations um, that can then be kind of going out to regulatory bodies to help inform decision making um, on how the, how the technology would proceed. Um, and then I think the other big important thing with us thinking about a coordinating body was how, you know, Bill, uh, you know, communities in Burkina Faso and um, communities in, say, New Zealand we might be thinking about really different things, but there might be commonalities as well. So how do we start to connect deliberation around the world to sort of learn from these different processes and allow them to become sort of more iterative and, and sort of um, organically sort of grow and become more effective? Um, it also was important from an idea from a coordinated regional decision-making standpoint where, for example, if New Zealand is thinking about eliminating an invasive possum that's sort of come from Australia, um, and that, you know, a gene drive were used and that were to escape to Australia, Australia has a right to kind of be involved in some of those discussions because they are, you know, could be impacted by these decisions. And so we thought a coordinated body could be important for sort of um, organizing that. Um, and then on like a more kind of broader scale, there would sort of be a space there too where, you know, workshops could be held, um, different sort of gatherings to sort of, again, begin to sort of inform global governance on a more general, on a general level. Um, and so, again, sort of thinking about the, the ways to, to think about this, there'd be these local deliberative processes that would be highly context dependent, that would be occurring as early as possible in any sort of technologies development. Um, They'd be obviously formulated, be responsive, thinking about innovation responsibly, and they'd be iterative. So this isn't just like one meeting at the beginning and then it stops. This is something that's kind of occurring throughout the process of the text development. The global coordination also had to uphold certain sort of values. Uh, one was independence, and this to us was also super important because what we're seeing right now happening is, um, you know, in, in a responsible, you know, in trying to do well, we're seeing a lot of the tech developers actually directly interfacing with the communities that are making decisions on whether the tech should proceed or not. Um, and whether, you know, to us, whether that's intentional, either way it creates a conflict of interest. Um, and despite how well these can be organized to be really as fair and sort of um, unbiased as possible, there is going to be interest to use tech in some way or another. If you are the developer, that would only be natural. Um, and so we felt that there does need to be a third party that can serve as sort of the interfacing, the interface between the tech developers and the, and the communities making those choices. Um, and this is sort of like the last sort of thing too I want to bring up, and this is something that we struggle with and I think is still a really big open-ended question. Um, is in creating a system like this, how do you really build sort of authority into the decision-making um, outcomes? Um, and then of course also how do you make sure that this sort of organization doesn't fall down some of the same holes maybe other large global organizations have where they start to sort of lose accountability. Um, and, and that I think is still a very open-ended question, something we're really aware of, and some of the thing we're trying to think through. Um, right now. And of course, this is another big thing too, right, is making sure again that the decision outcomes do have an impact to influence um, influencing. So that's sort of that's sort of a brief overview of what you were, also I invite you all, if you haven't yet, read our proposal. It's, it's really, it's really supposed to be a jumping off point. Um, there's so there's so much there that still needs to be sorted out. And so please, uh, I'll have my email at the end. Email me thoughts and are get in touch because we're really trying to sort of make this again just the beginning of a really important conversation. Um, okay, I'm going to try and stop soon because I know we're moving forward this way longer than I thought. You still have five minutes. You're fine. Mm. Look, we're about to get to like my favorite part of it. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is all, you know, this is all really important stuff, right, to, to try and create space that's going to allow for really more informed, um, integrated um, decision making in, in, in a way that's just and, and responsible and fair. But something that I kind of been thinking a lot recently about, um, pretty deeply, is that it's all fine and good, but I, I, what I really worry right now is I think we're facing an ethical void. And I think it's because these technologies are really pushing the limits of how we can think about how to make choices based on how we relate to non-human nature and how we relate to other humans. Um, and from an environmental ethics standpoint, I struggle to find an ethic that fits, that could uphold 
two important things. Um, that the flourishing of both humans and non-humans are considered in how these choices are made, and that at the same time there's space for technology and that sort of flourishing. And I mean that by meaning that sort of in a general Western context of, of environmental ethic, um, often the, the ethos that I'm sort of drawn to are pretty divergent. So one, one, one that I'm kind of drawn to is this idea of deep ecology, right, which means really sees like really deep sort of connection with nature, um, a lot of respect for nature and humility towards nature, um, and kinship in a way with nature, which is what resonates a lot with me too. But most deep ecologists generally tend to be very anti-tech. Um, and that part doesn't resonate because I do see technology as being something that can be important in, in sort of advancing our relationship with nature and advancing and, and, and healing our planet. And so what I, what I feel is what was really also equally of need is sort of an, an updated environmental ethic when we think about how we're going to make choices about this technologies, these technologies. And it's something that's going to have to somehow integrate this, kin this idea of kinship with nature but with an appreciation for technology. Um, and this is sort of what I'm thinking, and I hope again this can help spur some conversation because I'll be curious to see what you all feel. And this is really new, so don't <laughs> ask me to go into too many details because I'm new thoughts. <laughs> um, but when I say in kinship with nature, I think that has to, that has to fill certain, certain arguments. Um, and firstly, what I see that is, is that we have to see ourselves as part of this larger natural process. If we see humans as separate, I worry that we will definitely not be able to make the right choices that these sorts of decisions require. Um, I also see this as nature having its, its intrinsic value, so being valuable in of itself, not necessarily being valuable only in how it can serve us as humans, so that's different from something that would be more utilitarian. Um, and again, as I've already mentioned, both of these have to be equally upheld. I can't see this being over this and somehow being able to create responsible decisions. So what does that mean? That might mean that when we think about suppressing a mosquito species for, say we're trying to address this malaria issue. If we're trying to uphold flourishing of humans and non-humans, the conversation normally comes down to this issue of, well, if we don't do this, you know, nearly 500,000 people might die every year. But if we, if we, if, if we do have to do it, then we're driving mosquito extinct, potentially. And to me, I don't see it as this either or. Maybe that's just, that dichotomy isn't appropriate and we can't even make that choice. Maybe that means we have to think of better ideas of perhaps influencing the mosquito so that it can't carry malaria but isn't actually fully suppressed to extinction. And those are the sorts of ideas that I think we can think about to ensure flourishing of both. This is where it gets a little more tricky, is that how technology can fit into something that looks like this. Um, I think, firstly, it has to argue that technology in itself is not bad or, or good. It's how it's used. And I know people say that all the time, but I think that actually that statement has a lot of meaning, and I think that needs to be remembered, because if we paint technology out of the get-go as potentially being bad or disruptive, then the whole thing is going to fall apart. I think this is where it gets a little more complicated, but I think we can begin to think about technology as part of our own natural process and evolution that it can be natural. That's not something that falls from the sky and we're hit, up, hit from, you know, from some other sort of, from outer space. Um, and I think that that's something that if we think about it, if humans are part of nature, and humans are part of this evolutionary trajectory, and technology is, a, is our own sort of creativity and innovation, I can, fit, I can feel that there's ways we can fit it into the natural evolutionary process. Um, and because of that, then this somehow now technology can fit into the relationship with, with nature. And so this is just something I want to start thinking about and sort of invite everyone to think about is how can we start to, again, integrate these two ideas so that we can really have frameworks that can steer us through these, these really deep questions about engineering wild species and how that will impact the future of, of the planet that we all share. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at, at that, and well, no, I'll leave it in some in gratitude because I want to just thank um, the different programs that have helped support um, my work and continue to in some shape or form. Um, I invite you. This is our website at www.edinnature.org, um, and here is my email. Please email me um, any sort of feedback. Um, I also tweet occasionally, but it's not my forte. <laughs> um, 
But this is one we have for editing nature, and I don't have mine. I have one. I think I'm at. I think I'm at Natalie Kofler. Um, so if you want to, I, I kind of do some updates there, but I'm not too active, and I don't. Please, if you want discussion, just email me. Don't tweet at me. Um, so thank you so much, and thank you for all your attention. Todd, I saw your yeah, I'm, I really liked your talk, and I liked how you ended it, because I really relate to that, because I think I'm struggling with the same sort of, I would say, environmental ethics yeah. questions. Um, and so I'm curious, sort of this idea, I don't know if you've, if you've heard of sort of this notion of bright green environmentalists, right? So it's sort of like, it goes from the deep ecology to the deep green, yeah. right? And the bright green is sort of the technology, yeah. I think, piece. I think for me, what, what I struggle with to get to the technology side is, yeah. is that I have to, or we have to admit that we failed as a society to sort of protect nature, right? Because we know that there's actually other solutions, societal solutions and changes, or things that we've decided to do that directly got us to where we are now. Yeah. And so we have to sort of recognize that reality. This is the way I sort of justify sort of being, saying we should use a gene drive, right? Is because you have to recognize that failure and that reality, and I think part of that is why these international discussions in the CBD and IUCN are so difficult yeah. because we're it's hard for us yeah. environmentalists yeah. to admit that yeah. and to admit that society at large has sort of yeah. failed mm -hmm. and so I'm curious your thoughts on like how do you have that conversation which is really a reality based conversation but it's a reality that you don't want to admit because it's it's well, hard to say that I think um so I didn't get into this. I think this is where facilitation is so critical of conversation. And I've done some like some small workshops of trying to think about how to facilitate these really difficult conversations. And I think um, it, it is absolutely pertinent that history is brought to the table. And that's, in, and that's any sorts of history. So I think even irrespective of what histories of how technologies have been used, it's histories of how different groups have treated each other. Um, and that and that has to almost happen at the get-go, and it has to be a really candid conversation. Um, and so that's where I think facilitation is actually, um, if I ever can finally get the funding to really start building this, that's where I think a lot of the, like, the money has to go, is actually in supporting really, really skilled facilitators. Um, and I agree with you that what's happening right now in the international um, so I was at the I was at the UN um, CBD meeting um, in November in Egypt. So I got to and this was my first one, which was a real pleasure. Um, well, I, got I warned to, you. you know, <laughs> I, know, you, like, I wasn't prepared, but she did try to help. Um, I um, I witnessed it firsthand. Of just you're, you're right. It's just it's not going to go anywhere if we don't take space and time to really unpack what's happened historically. But that's a big mm. conversation and that's a really commi big commitment. And what I worry is back to this issue of time. Mm. No one's carving out that time to, to do that. Um, but I think back again is what, I think that's where this is important too, right? And that's kind of getting down to what you're saying, is that if we can't, sort of, we need to like let this idea go that it's not the technology itself that's this evil carrying thing. It's it's who's it's who's been at the table making those decisions. And when again look at history, it's been a pretty narrow group of people, men generally, not to you know making those choices. And I think that's where I become very optimistic, is that there's so many pe different kinds of people now in the, in the conversation. Yeah. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so much here to talk about, and so now I wish I'd like sign up for lunch with you, but I didn't do that. <laughs> um, I want to go back to local participation. Yeah. Um, so I'm a cultural anthropologist, um, okay. and um, I've been kind of looking at local participation in one form or another for like 25 years. Well, yeah, we um, talk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I thought, oh, her, that minor in international development is oh, no. all over this, it was right? So long ago. <laughs> But so, but then I got scared when I was listening because like, you know elite capture of those processes are just notorious. 
Um, but also, um, where, where I work in southern Mexico, the subordination has been so ongoing. You can like have a participatory process and everybody's like, they're not expecting any participation. So let's figure out yeah. what they want us to say and we will put that forward as the thing we want to participate in. Yeah. So you get into these like really weirdo dynamics and someone at Yale who I love is Michael Dove. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he's been, um, he's kind of been a leader in the field in explaining to us how this happens and, and what happens in state bureaucracies around the world in these development settings. Anyway, so the question. Yeah. Did you guys, um, like, what were you talking about that at your conference or is that one of the things maybe to talk about in the future? I think so that's moving forward. I can, just from a personal note, um, I have the same fear that you just brought up. And I think probably the thing that would scare me the most to happen was to have our proposal put out and then have people try and put it together that don't think about it in the thoughtful way that it would need to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think for, for in thinking about it, it's also a lot um, about really building it from a level of the values that are up, going to uphold this process, right? Mm -hmm. So that gets back to, again, thinking about well, firstly, what does a, does a deliberative process look like when the purpose is not just to get to A to B, it's really to like step back and really explore this in a really deep, meaningful way. And if it requires people to enter into that space with senses of humility, with appreciations of being open to histories, mm -hmm. right? Back to thinking about that. Mm -hmm. and, with, and I think the other big thing is how do you also encourage, um, it's gonna be so important to encourage reflection. Right? So this isn't about just like talking at and having a chance to have people have voices. It's about transforming through the process of the deliberation and creating the space that actually allows people to leave transformed from based on what they've heard. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that's a scientist, whether that's a community that might be impacted, it's, it, that, that's, an, I think, powerful and important on every level. But I think it's also important to sort of stress that I'm kind of stuck, I, I, you know, I was a specialist for so long learning mm -hmm. about cellular movement. I'm really stepping more into the space of, of a generalist and really I see my role as creating and bringing together the people that need to be there to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't, I will never be an expert or study, you know, local deliberations, but it's more of a question of how to ensure that that's done and that I can create the space that allows it to happen. Hi. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, yes, thank you. And it was like one of the best um, summaries and articulations of what good or great governance, deliberative governance can be. So oh, you did that. Thank you. Did it very well. Thank you. Uh, the thing that came to mind when I was listening to you was um, when you put it, like, if you were to do all of this yeah. um, and, and, and do it well, uh, the question that came to me was, well, what, what are the tensions and conflicts and paradoxes that remain? So what can't we kind of solve with yeah. good process and good decision making? And what are you, in your discussions at that at your meeting, where they're like, oh, this tension is always going to remain no matter what we do well, and it's, it, we have to become okay with living with that tension or with living with the imperfectibility of, or the, the almost the paradox of these situations. Yeah. So I so that did not really come up, and to be honest, I full disclosure, I don't. I'm glad you're bringing that up because I don't spend a lot of time in that space. You're a very optimistic person. I'm so glad that I think it's the only way I can just keep going, right? And I really, like, I'm always, and I think that that's actually been a big thing for me is, like, I'm also always, like, I'm pretty future thinking. So it's actually been really important for me to think more of histories and how important they are and the tensions or the reality of things, right? And so, I mean, the thing that comes to mind firstly is, like, is corporate interest in economics is going to be a tension that's going to be there, that there's power, and the power dynamics that are present, I think, are going to be really um, important to not be, we won't be able to correct them. And, and that's on every level, right? That's on, if you have a group of people coming from different, you know, worldviews and, and walks of life, there are power dynamics even at that table that you are not going to be able to, to fix. But shining light on them and being aware of them and recognizing them is, is, I think, what we can strive to do. And so whether that's at the deliberative space, whether that's on the larger kind of global context of the power dynamics that are going to shift and shape these decisions, I think the best we can hope for is at least 
to not keep them in the dark and have them be there and, and appreciate it. Is that a, yeah. okay? Because I don't want to start listing off all the different <laughs> gender. I mean, there's all sorts of power dynamics, right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. This is perfect segue to my question. Okay. Um, how? I mean, you just said you're a very optimistic. Person. <laughs> but and there's probably not an answer to this. But how do you get buy-in for this local yeah. deliberation when the people with the power have no incentive to give up power? Yeah. And the only thing that can result from this is them losing power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so, okay, I see, okay, let me step back. This is, this is why I think timing is so important. I see right now this really small window of time where I see technologists generally um, being relatively open to and encouraging a local, locally based deliberation and sort of seeding that power, whether it's, you know, so I do see it kind of right now, there might be this opportunity we can start to sort of recreate this new system. Um, to try and build authority on a more, like, practical long term, you have, I think you have to also get buy-in from somehow through regulatory processes that somehow make sure that deliberative outcomes that come from these are upheld and sort of reflected upon. And if that's the best we can do, even, it's not, and I'm not even gonna stop there, but I mean, if you think about what sort of public engagement looks like right now from a regulatory decision-making standpoint, we can do so much better. If that means that at least we have these like deliberative reports that come out of this really thoughtful, meaningly, meaningful locally-based deliberation to help at least have some sort of influence on those decisions, that is a step forward. Um, but to see, to sort of like seeds, to sort of totally, change hands of who has the decision-making power, I think it's going to be a major um, challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this and, is a follow-up. Yeah. yeah. So taking taking this deliberation beyond the lip service, which yeah, is I kind of, I guess, how you're interpreting yeah. current regulations. Yeah. I mean, so the other way, right, to do it is that I think the other thing that gives me some hope is that um, if to really meaningfully do this really early on in the technology's development and that you can sort of sell it to technologists that this will allow you to have less public pushback later on or it might allow you to create a more effective technology, then there's ways to kind of get buy-in early. Um, but whether who gets power in the end to make the ultimate decisions I think will be a really challenging thing. Um, sorry, Wait, yeah, I'm just kind of... No, like, I don't know who is first. I, um, I might actually... Like, if you were... I don't know. I'll take you go. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't see my source. Um, so this slide really speaks to me. And okay. when I look at this, I struggle more with the technology appreciation. Yeah. But if I'm honest and I think about probably most other people might actually struggle with the kinship of nature. Okay. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering if you thought of that kind of, you know, humans is part of nature, nature has a kind of value to have. Yeah. If communities don't feel that way, I know. So how do we how do we promote something like that? And should you promote it? I think is the other question. Sorry. And should you promote yeah. it? Yeah, I know, right? Because yeah. you also yeah. want to respect yeah. different values yeah. of relationship and not enforce them. Um, I know, and I I try to be neutral, and like I'm not. Like I think it's silly to say I am because I I do actually really buy into this, and I. My heart and soul tells me that if this doesn't happen, I don't know how we're going to be able to make safe choices that are safe for everybody in our planet. And so, um, how to sort of, yeah, I don't know, thank you, you're really stumping me, and I think that's something I have to think about, because again, it's also like you don't want to, no one wants to, for, I don't want to be forcing my value system on somebody else. Um, but I also think you can come to a situation where sometimes there is a value system that just isn't okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you step back through histories and certain value systems are upheld about how we treat other humans and now they aren't okay, how does that change when we start to expand our relationship beyond the human then it also doesn't become okay to treat non-humans in that way. Um, and so I do think I don't know. I have to, yeah, I have to really feel feel that one out more. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, just now I have to make two quick 
tongue. Yeah, sure. So that's my original question, because it's a take us back to technology. Well, one of the things, I mean, this idea of nature having intrinsic value and us being a part of nature, one of the issues that just occurred to me is how many different ways, how many different schools and ways of looking at that. For instance, American transcendentalism, right, which had one assumption about humans in nature yeah. and nature, yeah. uh, and now, um, I say, post-humanism, which has a very different, and you know, it, it feeds a lot of ecological, environmental uh, yeah. thinking and philosophy, object-oriented philosophy, etc. Et so there's like completely different views um, that all do do some version of that, and then I, I guess I can use this as a segue to get to the idea of to how you define deliberation, <laughs> right? And and not only not only is there a history of that, you know, yeah. in many fields, but then yeah. like different countries, different communities, yeah. will have different notions yeah. of deliberation. So it kind of touches on your question yeah. about yeah. how to sell it to you know a local government no. or whoever is going to make a decision. Those are, those are the yeah. Comments. So I would yeah. Let's talk about that second part. Okay. So um, I think that's a really I think that's a really important point, and I think that it's going to be a challenge, right? That we I mean partly that's why we think about decentralizing it in this way, so that they can be tailored to the different communities that are going to have sort of different structures and values. But what happens then? So you go into a community that has really different ideas around. Um, gender equality, yeah. yes. right? Yeah. And so does, or is this going to be another sort of colonial idea where we come in and force, well, all, you know, women, you know, do we go in and force that because that's the value that we, you know, and that's, this is like, I, I'm not saying either way, I'm saying that those are the things that have, are going to have to be really thought out yeah. about thinking about, or thinking about, you know, not coming in and again, forcing our value systems on other communities, but at the same time, you know, if it is this idea of making sure that marginalized voices are at the table, then how do you sort of switch that? And so I think um, there's going to have to be a lot of cultural sensitivity, but also ways that perhaps empower voices that have it in, in different kinds of ways to allow them to be part of the conversation. You can see how this is connected to human rights. And, oh, definitely. Right? I mean, it's like, so it's yeah, really definitely. huge, yeah. but, it's, but it's good to have it all. My place really on one slide. <laughs> Can I ask my question? Then I'll just. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. It's just a very quick. Well, no, actually, it's not very quick. Certainly, the answer isn't quick. I wanted. I want to challenge, or at least question, in a kind of Heideggerian way, the, the assumption that technology is value neutral. <laughs> um, and, and just really simply, without citing anybody, um, just to say that I think there are intrinsic values, speed, efficiency, accuracy, mm. productivity, okay. homogeneity, mm -hmm. these okay. are these are values that are yeah, built into cool. all mm -hmm. technologies. Mm -hmm. I'm laying and winter is way in the background. Mm -hmm. But but you know so and that that ideology that emerges mm -hmm. that, that, I mean it's really the mm -hmm. technology that the problem is the ideology of technology and the technological imperative, mm -hmm. right, that you have to do it. Mm -hmm. So it exerts pressure in the way that corporations exert pressure, right? Because mm -hmm. it wants to be implemented and it's there and we're going with it. And then it fuses with economics and uh, politics and you know, really gets pushed forward as a, uh, a kind of enormous force. It might seem value neutral because these values we have absorbed so thoroughly, yeah. we don't see them. Yeah, you know what, I think I need to change that language because, no, thank you, actually, no, because I think the way I was thinking about it, and again, it's like these are kind of new things I'm playing with, Oh. Is sort of something that I've wit that I witness a lot in the environmental space um, is you know the environment is good, humans are good can be good or bad, technology is bad, yeah. right? And right. so I think right. that was sort of what I'm kind of more getting what's right. getting at this idea that like right. technology is not necessarily good or bad. It's how it's and I think I, so I need to kind of I don't know if that's yeah. maybe value isn't the right word. It's more of like uh, yeah I gotta think that through. But yeah. that sort of that sort of like really sort of that it's, it 
it's not doing justice to the issue when we think about it in such sort of yeah. yeah, evaluation. Yeah. Or value. Evaluation. Yeah. Evaluation. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Versus versus value. like imperative or even ideology. Yeah. You know where. So yeah. the technology is its, it's own tools. Yeah. 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 Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. Question, I'm just wondering if this sort of came up and what you're thinking might, yeah. there might not be a solid answer to this. You know, in terms of, uh, say, the del say the optimism works, <laughs> you know, actually have this, you know, decentralized, you know, a highly locally engaged process with uh, across a, a highly heterogeneous landscape. I mean, because it's not Burkina Faso, it's Burkina Faso and Mali. And yeah, 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 yeah. Very vastly different. Yeah, even within Burkina Faso. Even within Burkina Faso, yeah, yeah, yeah. is like dozens of languages. I mean, so who gets to say no? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. at what point, you know, it's just yeah. like the, the aggregation yeah, of I know. truly, I know. you know, purposefully engaged opinions is that someone receiving the exact same information, they may just decide no. Well, and in a landscape level, area-wide intervention mm -hmm. to pretend mm -hmm. like yeah. it's not going to interact with them. Maybe it changes like a, a decision to go with a low threshold gene drive versus a higher threshold gene drive so we can attempt to avoid certain areas, but like, let's be honest about where we can yeah, draw no, these I lines. Yeah, I don't think that's really so, yeah, so a solution. I feel like that tension might be part of what Adam's talking about. Yeah. And, and it seems so fundamental to the aggregation of any sort of local. Well, decision. I think what you're kind of getting at too is that consensus. The more people you have at the table, the harder yeah. consensus is. Like it's just not going to happen, you know. And so I, I. Is consensus necessary? No, I, guess I think yeah. it's part of it, right? And so I think that also gets down to thinking about how to design the deliberation and how to design sort of the outputs of that deliberation um, where it's not necessarily, I don't think, I think in the in the paper you write like yes, no, or maybe not yet is sort of like one thing. I know it's so simplistic. I think maybe it has, X, X ends up getting designed where it's not even a yes or no. It's sort of this idea to do, to sort of get feedback and get sort of input in a way that can inform technology in a different way and how it's used and how the decisions are made even at the regulatory level. I don't know if it's going to be like, and this is me totally like contradicting, contradicting what we've written, but whether it's going to be just sort of like, yeah, go ahead, they say, I'll say, you know, most of them say yes and it's fine. Because I also don't think having like a vote is also necessarily a fair way to make these choices either. And so again, it's about thinking about how to integrate it into the technology's development, not even the technology's development, integrating it into a solution-making process, right? That the technology might be part of, but thinking about what is the actual issue that we're talking about, what are, you know, also making it clear that like, what are the alternatives that are available right now? How are we comparing them? How are we making these decisions? Are there things we haven't even thought about that could possibly work? And doing something more, you know, in this sort of more comprehensive, holistic way, which is something I haven't brought up yet. That was something we thought about a lot too. Yeah. Yeah, in the back. <laughs> 